from the Tiger Rising. We are on chapter five, page 14. The principal's office was small and dark and smelled like pipe tobacco. The secretary looked up at Rob when he walked in. Go right on back, she said, nodding her big blonde, her big head of blonde hair. He's waiting for you. Rob, said Mr. Filmer when Rob stepped into his office. Yes, sir, said Rob. Have a seat, Mr. Filmer said, waving his hand at the orange plastic chair in front of his desk. Rob sat down. Mr. Filmer cleared his throat. He patted the piece of hair that was combed over his bald head and he cleared his throat again. Rob, we're a bit worried, he said finally. Rob nodded. This was how Mr. Filmer began all of his talks with Rob. He was always worried. Worried that Rob did not interact with the other students. Worried that he did not communicate. Worried that he wasn't doing well in any way at school. Uh, it's about your um legs. Yes, your legs. Have you been putting that medicine on them? Yes, sir, said Rob. He didn't look at Mr. Filmer. He stared instead at the paneled wall behind the principal's head. It was covered with an astonishing array of things framed pieces of paper, certificates and diplomas and thank you letters. May I uh, look? asked Mr. Filmer. He got up from his chair and came halfway around his desk and stared at Rob's legs. Well, sir, he said after a minute. He went back behind his desk and sat down. He folded his hands together and cracked his knuckles and he cleared his throat. Here's the situation, Robert. Rob. Some of the parents, and I won't mention any names, are worried that what you got there might be contagious contagious means something that the other students could possibly catch. Mr. Flimmer cleared his throat again and he stared at Rob. Tell me the truth, son, he said. Have you been using that medicine that you told me about? The stuff the doctor in Jacksonville gave you? Have you been putting that on? Yes, sir, said Rob. Well, said Mr. Flimmer, let me tell you what I think and let me be upfront and honest with you. I think it might be a good idea if you had to stay home for a few days. What we'll do is we'll just give that old medicine more of a chance to kick in, let it start working its magic on you, and when we have you come back to school when your legs have cleared up. What do you think about that plan? Rob stared down at his legs. He felt the picture of the tiger burning in his pocket. He concentrated on keeping his heart from singing out loud with joy. Yes, sir, he said slowly. That would be all right. That's right, said Mr. Filmer. I thought you would think it was a good plan. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just write your parents, I'm, I mean your father, a note and tell him what's what. He can give me a call if, we want, if he wants. We can talk about it. Yes, sir, said Rob again. He kept his head down. He was afraid to look up. Mr. Filmer cleared his throat, scratched his head and adjusted his piece of hair. And then he started to write. When he was done, he handed the note to Rob. Rob took it, and when he was outside the principal's office, he folded the piece of paper up carefully and put it in his back pocket with the drawing of the tiger. And then finally, he smiled. He smiled because he knew something Mr. Filmer did not know. He knew that his legs would never clear up. He was free. Chapter 6. Rob floated through the rest of the morning. He went to math class and civics and science. His heart light, buoyed by the knowledge that he would never have to come back. At lunch, he sat out on the bleachers in the breezeway. He did not go into the lunchroom. Norton and Billy Thurmonger were there, and nothing had tasted good to him since his mother died, especially not the food at the school. It was worse than the food his father tried to cook. He sat on the bench and unfolded his drawing of the tiger, and his fingers itched to start making it in wood. He was sitting like that, swinging his legs, studying the drawing, when he heard shouting and the high-pitched buzz of excitement like crickets that the kids made when something was happening. He stayed where he was. In a minute, the faded red double doors of the lunchroom swung open and Sistine Bailey came marching through them, her head held high. Behind her was a whole group of kids. And just when Sistine noticed Rob sitting there on the bench, one of the kids threw something at her. Rob couldn't tell what it was, but it hit her, whatever it was. Run, he wanted to yell at her, hurry up and run. But he didn't say anything. He knew better than to say anything. He just sat and he stared at Sistine with his mouth open and she stared back at him. Then she turned and walked back into the group of kids like somebody walking into deeper water. And suddenly she began swinging with her fists. She was kicking. She was twirling. And then the group of kids closed in around her and she seemed to disappear. Rob stood up so that he could see her better. He caught sight of the pink dress. It looked all crumpled like wadded up tissue. He saw her arms still going like mad. Hey, he shouted, not meaning to. Hey, he shouted again louder, and he moved closer, the drawing of the tiger still in his hand. 
Leave her alone, he shouted, not believing that these words were coming from him. They heard him then, and they turned to him, and it was quiet for a minute. Who are you talking to? A big girl with black hair asked. Yeah, another girl said. Who do you think you're talking to? Go away, Sistine muttered in her gravelly voice, but she didn't look at him. Her yellow hair was stuck to her forehead with sweat. The girl with the black hair pushed up close to him. She shoved him. Leave her alone, Rob said again. You going to make me? The black-haired girl said. They were all looking at him, waiting. Sistine was waiting too, waiting for him to do something. He looked down at the ground and saw that what they had thrown at her. It was an apple. He stared at it for what seemed like a long time, and when he looked back up, they were all still waiting to see what he would do. And so he ran. And after a minute, he could tell that they were running after him. He didn't need to look back to see if they were there. He knew it. He knew the feeling of being chased. He dropped the picture of the tiger and he ran full out, pumping his legs and his arms hard. They were still behind him. A sudden thrill went through him when he realized that what they, he was doing was saving Sistine Bailey. Why he would try to save Sistine Bailey. Why he would want to save somebody who hated him. He couldn't say. He just ran and the bell rang before they caught him. He was late for his English class because he had to walk from the gym all the way to the front of the school. And he did not know where his drawing of the tiger was, but he still had Mr. Filmer's note in his back pocket, and that was all that truly mattered to him, the note that proved that he would never have to come back. Chapter 7 It turned out to be an extraordinary day in almost every possible way. It started out with finding the tiger, and it ended with Sistine Bailey sitting down next to him on the bus on the way home from school. Her dress was torn and muddied. There was a scrape down her right arm, and her hair stuck out in a hundred different directions. She sat down in the empty seat beside him and stared at him with her black eyes. There isn't any place else to sit, she said to him. This is the last empty seat. Rob shrugged. It's not like I want to sit here, she said. Okay, said Rob. He shrugged his shoulders again. He hoped that she wasn't going to thank him for saving her. What's your name? She demanded. Rob Horton, he told her. Well, let me tell you something, Rob Horton. You shouldn't run. That's what they want you to do. Run. Rob stared at her with his mouth open, and she stared back. I hate it here, she said, looking away from him, her voice even deeper than before. This is a stupid hick town with stupid hick teachers. Nobody in this whole school even knows what the Sistine Chapel is. I know, said Rob. I know what the Sistine Chapel is. Immediately, he regretted saying it. It was his policy not to say things, but it was a policy he was having a hard time maintaining with Sistine. I bet, Sistine sneered at him. I bet you do. It's a picture of God making the world, he said. Sistine stared at him hard, and she narrowed her small eyes until they almost disappeared. It's in Italy, said Rob. The pictures are painted on the ceiling. They're frescoes. It was as if a magician had cast a spell over him. He opened his mouth and the words fell out, one on top of the other, like gold coins, and he couldn't stop talking. I don't got to go to school on account of my legs. I got a note that says so. Mr. Flumer, he's the principal. He says the parents are worried that what I got is contagious. That means the other kids could catch it. I know what contagious means, Sistine said. She looked at her legs and then she did something truly astounding. She closed her eyes and reached out her left hand and placed it on top of Rob's left leg. Please let me catch it, she whispered. You won't, said Rob, surprised at her hand, how small it was and how warm. It made him think for a minute of his mother's hand, tiny and soft. He stopped that thought. It ain't contagious, he told her. Please let me catch it, Sistine whispered again, ignoring her and keeping her hand on his leg. Please let me catch it so I won't have to go back to school. It ain't a disease, said Rob. It's just me. Shut up, said Sistine. She sat up very straight. Her lips moved. The other kids shouted and screamed and laughed and called to each other, but the two of them sat apart from it all, as if their seat was an island in a sea of sweat and exhaust. Sistine opened her eyes, and she took her hand away and rubbed it up and down both of her own legs. You're crazy, Rob told her. Where do you live, Sistine asked, still rubbing her hands over her legs. In the motel, in the Kentucky Star. Do you live in a motel? She said, looking up at him. It ain't permanent, he told her. It's just until we get back on our feet. She stared at him. I'll bring you some homework, she said. I'll bring it to you at the motel. 
I don't want my homework, he told her. So, said Sistine. By then, Norton and Billy Thermonger had spotted them sitting together, and they were moving in. Rob was relieved when the first thump came at the back of his head, because it meant that he wouldn't have to talk to Sistine anymore. It meant that he wouldn't end up saying too much, telling her about important things like his mother or the tiger. He was glad almost that Norton and Billy were there to beat him into silence. Chapter 8 His father read the note from the principal slowly, putting his finger under the words as if they were bugs he was trying to keep still. What he finally done, when he was finally done, he laid the letter on the table and rubbed his eyes with his fingers and sighed. The rain beat a sad rhythm on the roof of the motel. The stuff ain't nothing nobody else can catch, his father said. I know, Rob told him. I already told that to the principal once before. I called up there and told him that. Yes, sir, said Rob. <sighs> his father sighed and he stopped rubbing his eyes and looked up at Rob. You want to stay home, he asked. Rob nodded. His father sighed again. Maybe I'll make an appointment, get one of those doctors to write down that what you got ain't catching, all right? Yes, sir, said Rob. But I won't do it for a few days. I'll give you some time off. That would be all right, said Rob. You got to fight them, you know. Them boys, I know you don't want to, but you got to fight them, else they won't ever leave you alone. Rob nodded. He saw Sistine twirling and punching and kicking, and the vision made him smile. In the meantime, you can help me out around here, his father said. Do some of the maintenance work, the motel, do some sweeping and cleaning for me. Beauchamp's running me ragged. There ain't enough hours in a day to do everything that that man wants done. Now go and hand me that medicine. His father slathered and slapped the fishy-smelling ointment on Rob's legs, and Rob concentrated on holding still. Do you think Beauchamp is the richest man in the world, he asked his father. Nah, his father said. He don't own but this one itty-bitty motel now. In the woods, he just likes to pretend he's rich is all. Why? I was just wondering, said Rob. He was thinking about the tiger pacing back and forth in the cage, and he was certain that the tiger belonged to Beauchamp. And you wouldn't. You have to be the richest man in the world to own a tiger? Rob wanted desperately to go see the tiger again, but he was afraid that he had imagined the whole thing. He was afraid that the tiger might have disappeared with the morning mist. Can I go outside? Rob asked when his father was done. Nah, his father said. I want that medicine rained off of you. It costs too much. Rob was relieved almost, that he had to stay inside. What if he went looking for the tiger and the tiger was not there? Rob's father cooked the macaroni and cheese for supper on the two burner hot plate that they kept on the table next to the TV. He boiled the macaroni too long and a lot of it stuck to the pan, so there weren't many noodles to go with the powdery cheese. Some day, he told Rob, you and me will have a house with a real stove and I'll do some good cooking then. This is good, Rob lied. You eat all you want, then I ain't that hungry, his father told him. After supper, his father fell asleep in the recliner with his head thrown back and his mouth open. He snored and his feet, big with crooked toes, jerked and trembled. In between the snores, his stomach growled long and loud, as if he was the hungriest man in the world. Rob sat on his bed and started to work on carving the tiger. He had a good piece of maple and his knife was sharp, and in his mind he could see the tiger clearly. But something different came out of the wood. It wasn't a tiger at all. It was a person with a sharp nose and small eyes and skinny legs. It wasn't until he started working on the dress that Rob realized he was carving Sistine. He stopped for a moment and held the wood out in front of him and shook his head in wonder. It was just like his mother had always said. You could never tell what would come out of the wood. It did what it wanted and you would just follow. He stayed up late working on the carving, and when he finally fell asleep, he dreamed about the tiger, only it wasn't in a cage. He dreamed about it was free, and it was running through the woods, and there was something on its back, but Rob couldn't tell what it was. As the tiger got closer and closer, Rob saw that the thing was Sistine in her part pink party dress. She was riding the tiger, and in his dream, Rob waved to her, and she waved back at him, but she didn't stop. She and the tiger kept going, past Rob, deeper and deeper into the woods. And that is the end of chapter 8.